Hello everyone, today we talk about Ambrose of Milan and the foundation of a Romano-Christian imperial consciousness passing through this troubled time, in fact Roman history uh, between the, the 70s and the 90s of the 4th century where important figures were uh, you know, uh, living and acting in a quite troubled situation, right? Um, talking about uh, Ambrose, uh, Bishop of Milan, of course, Emperor Gratian, eventually Theodosius, right, in um, in a picture that uh, I think it's useless, if not banal, to, to, to recall in here, right, in these conditions of fear, of insecurity, of um, semi-collapse of uh, of the empire, right? At least this shouldn't uh, mistake, uh, let's say, the graduality, of course, of the transformation of the empire in the crisis, etc., with the fact that, you know, it was not the case. It, everything was more or less fine, and these uh, elites were kind of exaggerating the problems. Actually, it was a, a problem of the masses. They were suffering here heavily, right, from wars, you know, taxes, devastations, and that the elites were called, in fact, to, to control um, in, a, in a future perspective that wasn't definitely the brightest one, right? So this sense of anxiety and of, and of fear, as we're describing it now, is strongly perceived uh, at this point, but it's also quite violent time in itself. There are passions and moral forces that are um, clashing, and lots of problems that go beyond, in fact, the mere material aspect of the story, but, you know, you know, calling to, uh, into question some major moral um, uh, matters that naturally uh, invest the, the religious perspective that at the time was dominant in every affair, right? Uh, let's the, the empire, doesn't matter whether it was Christian or pagan, this time that the, there is still the transition, but religion was fundamental to the same idea of the empire, would remain for those times uh, and peoples for you know for, for, for quite a long time, it was functional to that world, right? And there was a genuine concern for these perspectives, not just for a m mere political calculation, but also for, you know, dealing with tragedies and sufferings that uh, couldn't even at least be igno ignored, right? So we concentrate on Ambrose of Milan, and other times we could, uh, we will actually surely discuss Augustine of Hippo uh, as these two major uh, figures in the um, Christian thinking uh, in the late uh, fourth century, and this um, take that they they have on the current political but also military all right, uh, aspects, uh, events of the empire that um, are definitely important for the Christian consciousness at the time. Um, Ambrose, as Bishop of Milan, and here we're talking about very high levels of the ecclesiastical hierarchy that were in strong contact with, with the secular ones, right? At this point the empire is not officially Christian yet, but of course the, the alliance between the the empire and the, uh, and the church is, is strong, right? It's already founded uh, in many ways, but it, it's still somewhat conflictual in itself because the, the fusion between uh, these two worlds is, y is yet to, to arrive. It will ar arrive, in fact, at the very end of the 4th century itself, so we're, we're fairly close, but definitely society is still um, in trouble, it's still trying to find a center, and, and these thinkers investigate the possibilities, the um, the realities that can be opened by you know a certain approach rather than another. Always think that here the church is um, has not forgotten that it had been persecuted, you know, up to you know less than one century before, and that the, the relation with uh, the secular authority is somewhat complicated because the church doesn't see itself. Uh, as you know, the state doesn't aim at that, but thinks it, uh, at itself as something fundamentally, m metaphysically separated, right, from the earthly affairs. Albeit, it also has the care of the souls and has to uh, regulate the communities in also in a secular field. And naturally, 
the practice of politics, the you know, the real politic, if you if you prefer, naturally makes already the, the ecclesiastical elites deeply involved into secular politics, and uh, dealing with a lot of, um, of 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 power, of money, and of of responsibility in this regard. There are areas of the empire that are increasingly more. Um, regulated and uh, administered directly by the church when the the state fails, right? And this is particularly even in, in the West. But the fourth century is still a moment in which the empire is um, is, is co- has, has come from a you know from a healthy background. Like the fourth century and the Constantinian times have have seen um, a moment of restabilization after the crisis of the third century at the end of the fourth. Uh, things are getting rough again, right? Um, and today I would like to concentrate the focus in here on effectively the relation between Christianity and, and violence at this time, and of course of the church and the state, but in this sense the relation that exists between politics and the exercise of violence, right? War, uh, the Christian participation to the army. Um, these are important uh, concepts because you know, with the affirmation spread of Christianity uh, in the empire, not much effectively from a um, moral point of view had changed. Like Christianity didn't mm, shift fundamentally the the balance of you know combativeness or you know mm, uh, adherence to the political military models of the empire. Right, uh, say that Christianity since the very beginning. If you read Saint Paul. Uh, but even you know in, in the New Testament you find references to the uh, um, a, a spiritual struggle right that is something that dates uh, far back also before and that involves um, you know a, a violent language sometimes and violent concepts I mean the idea that um, Christianity operates in a totalizing dimension for uh, for the believer that has always to fight right uh against uh sin against um uh you know the the evil that is always threatening to take over and and his fate um and but this is not just a merely spiritual fight right it, it's chiefly a, a spiritual fight but but this has some um you know uh, consequence quite, Im- quite an important consequence in in the earthly world right so um, we will see now that th- there was already a, a base over which to build um, a theory of cooperation between uh, the church and the state, right? That is, however, fundamentally enhanced at this point, right? And there are many problems to surpass, um, chiefly and firstly, and it's something was very common, evidently, in, uh, in those times of civil war, of foreign invasions. Uh, and uh, general, um, you know, the distress of, of of the empire, crisis of the empire, uh, the problem of killing, right? You should violence be used, physical violence, um, by by the Christian, and and how does the Christian has to relate, however, with a state that is already, of course, military potent and that uh, requires society, including Christians, to participate to the army, right? So, naturally, as we were saying now, this had function. Uh, you know, Christians served the army since the, the very beginning of Christianity. I mean, the, the Roman army, had, I, I mean. And um, this hadn't created particular problems that the Christian uh, geography eventually will, you know, develop and and, and articulate this um, the stories of the of what ironically will become military saints because the, the faithful will see in, in these military saints that had been actually um, martyrized because they had refused to bear arms um, actual saints that could defend them uh, and that could be at their side where they were fighting against the enemies of the empire, the enemies of the fate so here you realize that uh, also the pagan pagan mindset and the contractualism that had characterized it remained for a long time. And in this regard, it's also very fascinating to look at imperial uh, political culture and w- and how and why uh, this decided to to approach also progressively Christianity also from a military point of view and. 
um, favoring also from, from their side this blending, this melding, the connection between state and church that would eventually prove to be a successful uh, union uh, over time in the history of the Roman Empire but also of course of other Christian powers in Europe uh, and elsewhere. So th the main problem is that killing, there is no way out of it. Killing in Christian terms is a sin, always. I made a video about this, about penitence um, um, in in the early medieval world and this debate around you know how much should you be punished for killing uh, someone and how this should you know what consequence this should have in the community of the faithful and in relation with the political authority so this doesn't disappear no father of the church will formulate a theory according to which killing is not a sin right and this is also very important because um, there is a dimension that is properly in fact the spiritual one in which this can in which the the earthly matters ca cannot interfere right killing is always a sin spiritually speaking the problem is that there is also another dimension one the earthly one in which this in some way must happen right this is prophetized in, in the scriptures it is um, in part um, you know uh, to, be, to be understood to be accepted right by divine uh, teaching and there is a um, a powerful connotation that um, the the same biblical messages were seen uh, before has towards the um, the idea of the struggle, of the fight, the idea of n needing to defend uh, the fate from uh, from the from evil and from uh, the, uh, the the weakness, uh, the wickedness of of mankind. Uh, this is a great problem because the church is a community, right? It's not a matter of just individuality and what how the a sort of economy that you can uh, play within yourself but it has no consequence uh, out of it um, let's not forget in here that already the pagan civilization had formulated f fundamental principles that eventually the Christians um, inherited and developed uh, further in you know together with their and their, their religion that together with their teachings such as uh, Cicero, for example, would distinguish between doing evil actively, but also doing evil by letting someone else do it. And that's a fundamental um, ethical problem that we seem dramatically to, to forget about today, right? The idea is that as long as I don't do anything, you know, I'm just a poor victim, all the uh, others are the evil people, I have no responsibility. Even you doing nothing or pretending that isolating or uh, not going stepping out there um, is is somewhat a way to you know to spare yourself uh, re regrets um, uh, and um, ethical responsibility is actually quite a, a an irresponsible thing to do in the first place right and it's um, shocking to see how simple-minded someone who reasons like that can be right it, but um, it you know human mind is lazy right and we like simple things because they make us uh, fatigue less but that's what stupid people are made of and <laughs> fundamentally there is no pride in it by any standard um, the and uh, the problem at that point in history was was deep right uh, the same Saint Ambrose of course stigmatized uh, just like others um, violence and and homicides um, his disdain towards assassination is deep and total. I mean, there is no way out of it. If you read, for example, um, the uh, in Examen on uh, six eight four forty eight, uh, you see this um, you know uh, atrocious description of of humanity as you know, how firm and decisive this stand is. On the other hand, uh, he also justified, however with force uh, every public action destined to preserve the state now this is the real point right here we're not talking about one state in general like today you hear the state you think uh, as a social contract in the sense of you know okay it's all, all secular and modern right at the time the state means the ecumenic divine empire um, that is the roman one 
right? Um, there is this has not even to do with what the official religion of the empire is. If there is a massive empire that rules what is effectively at, at the time the known world, um, it doesn't matter. That, I don't know. It was China, or they knew about other places. It doesn't matter at all. Rome here dominates the universe. This is a universal empire by definition, and it was recognized by everyone, including people who lived outside of it. So that this state is also the one in which um, uh, Jesus Christ was born, crucified, and resurrected, right? So uh, it, it is not an empire like the others. Um, the same Roman authorities w were responsible for, uh, the, you know, as even as a medium, right? But also in here, importantly, from a moral point of view, still responsible because they had simply obeyed what um, the, the local community that asked, that is, to, to kill uh, Jesus, um, is, um, is effectively um, filled with, with this divine uh, task of, you know, performing such actions and uh, signifying not just a mere local authority, but effectively the greatest authority that always derives from from the divinity, right? Um, everything was already written, then this had to be accomplished, right? And uh, therefore this vision is, um, it uh, overloads with responsibility even those who are, uh, yes, feeling to be part of, of, a s of a different community first and foremost, but still being uh, mortals uh, that uh, Acknowledge th the importance of their action, of their ethical responsibilities on Earth, and have to deal uh, with uh, the Empire as an interlocutor, as as part of the uh, the same uh, protector of the Church that at this point had become. All right. So you you can f um, feel here the distance, the difference that exists between uh, the contempt towards homicide and the need, however, of using force for public good, right? Uh, this thing may seem irreconcilable if you uh, think that, in fact, violence is uh, a sin in itself, while this is not, right? Um, it's not in itself there must be um, in, uh, in the exercise of, of an earthly power an amount, if anything, in potential of, of, of military power, of violence, right? This goes in parallel uh, to the exercise of justice. You cannot deliver justice if you do not enforce it violently, right? Pilatus was doing his job when he had Jesus crucified, right? He was acting neutrally from an earthly point of view from a secular point of view he wasn't from a spiritual point of view because he was a human being who had a choice and, and and opted for a decision rather than the other but the point is that these two levels are separated right um, these two levels are essentially different and and the spiritual one is superior to the secular one but it's exactly for this reason that it makes a difference the reason violence is used makes a difference, because we can make a difference. Violence is just a medium. Violence in itself has no morality. Uh, it's not morally polarized. Violence is not positive or negative. It's just a medium. What makes a difference, morally speaking, is how we use it. That is, how we decide to employ it. It's a mere instrument. It's very close to Witzian as a definition, and this thought was evidently out there, uh, this realization was out there even at the time. Um, so St. Ambrose in here as the uh, the wall ecclesiastical hierarchy of his time felt the church invested towards the empire of a task right of legacy and preservation um, that entailed naturally a series of, of social values and duties. Bishops like Ambrose were controlling some of the most powerful cities of the empire. Tens or thousands or more actually thinking about those who lived in the countryside 
depended on them on the on the supplying systems of the city working on the charity services of uh, even of control I mean at this time the, the West was still functional so public authority was there as well but the church is growing as a as a major um, social uh, controller and organizers on which depend alive in fact of many many people so uh, the requests for the for security for defense um, right if you don't have public security public security is probably the first human right that you must have you can't have a, s a functional society if you have people who you know kill each other if you have an enemy who is threatening you uh, at any moment to to steal your goods to to kill you um, to abuse you this is a serious problem so in such a troubled moment like that with literally the, the barbarian at the gates and the same Romans actually doing the worst things against one another um, and w we're triggering a reaction from the masses right uh, the masses were seeking for peace for bread for s stability this is what we all ask of the role uh, still in our world we want first and foremost to live in a stable system right the you know abstract principles of you know absolutism or whatever the world should ideally be and we leave it in fact to the spiritual side of the story right but the reality of this world is quite quite different and our first duty is to provide those essential um, securities and um, and stabilities for which we, we can be allowed to, to prosper, right? So Ambrose at this level was uh, the spiritual guide of the Emperor Gratian, right? See here we're talking about really the top level of the Empire. Milan is effectively basically the most important city in, in the West together with Trier at this point. Um, it's really an important center also that has a military character right so the, the controlling those areas meant to have a stable um, uh, control in turn of broad areas of Europe and also the, the communications for the armies for, for, for the supplies right and that's also what invasions were threatening usually in civil wars were, were ravaging right and as the title of today's video says Ambrose founds, together with Gratian, the uh, Romano-Christian imperial consciousness that will characterize eventually Roman history uh, for, for centuries to, to till the very end. Um, this, this is important because, as we were saying before, the, uh, the, the church and state had, had at this point been allies, but had not necessarily been perceived as you know, mutually um, uh, supportive as a part of a on an ensemble of you know um, of a, in fact a, of a single universal entity right the two the universal powers would remain ideally distinguished but uh, institutionally speaking um, the church had still been relatively from one side and and the empire from the other that eventually just with the edict of the Salonica uh, Christianity will become the official religion of the empire and and the fourth century had been, um, you know, difficult also for the same religious policies of emperors, right? Uh, the main one being the struggle uh, between Catholics and Arians, right? For not talking about paganism, that especially among the, the secular elites was very alive and strong and, you know, culturally capable. So um, this was a very complex picture in which the empire was also oppressed, as we've seen by by external populations that are getting Christianized in turn but that have their own view uh, of what the empire should be of what also uh, Christianity uh, can be interpreted like the clash between uh, in fact Catholics and Arians is sometimes the same between the Romans and the Germans um, but this is a clash that goes on within the same borders of the empire uh, after all the the empire of Julian who had tried to restore the old um, pagan uh, religion had was was pretty recent right so uh, it was not such a you know okay Constantine arrives Christianity kicks in it's fine no the, the fourth century was um, it was a stable uh, time for 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 many points of view 
that partly favored, in fact, even the dialogue, the, the you know, the peaceful confrontation between uh, different uh, creeds and beliefs. Um, but uh, still, the the full institution institutionalization of Christianity was 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 yet to to come, right? Um, and the collaboration of Ambrose with Gratian was continuous and indefectible for all the length of the uh, the empire uh, of, of Gratian during b between 375 and 383 right these were very meaningful years difficult ones that had followed to the last great pagan offensive in fact the one of Julian um, but also they were more importantly the uh, gloomy years following the battle of Adrianople right uh, this was um you know on ex post we, we we know that Adrianople wasn't uh, an irreparable loss that after all the empire showed it exactly in here also thanks to um, even the cooperation of Christians and pagans at this point um, uh, you know a, a great uh, moral resource uh, and the uh, resourcefulness and the capacity of you know reviving even the civil uh, addicts in front of the, the, cata the military catastrophe and eventually to provide even larger means than those that had been uh, wiped out uh, at uh, at Adrianople, but in these years the situation once again was yet to be settled. Like the, the gods pressed from the east, the Alamanni were threatening to submerge uh, Gaul, right? So this was a time of uh, of action for the empire and of efforts and sacrifices from the subjects. Ambrose dedicated to Gratian the first two books of his De Fide, so on the faith, uh, wishing him victory against the gods that uh, he that the emperor was about to to repel, right? So it's a moment in which, r really, um, uh, history could take different turns because uh, um, you know even single victories on the field or defeats made a lot of difference uh, in a time in which demographic resources were progressively um, exhausting themselves and also um, the, the empire was ever more difficult to keep all all together. Theodosius will manage it. In, in, in the 90s of the 4th century, after a few years, after, you know, usurpers, invaders uh, had um, disrupted this unity, but you know, at least that he d decided, okay, well, no, administratively speaking, the empire must be split and it will b remain effectively split uh, from that point onward. Um, so, but here you feel the, you know, the moral commitment of, of the bishop to back to support uh, spiritually the imperial military action right these are armies leaving for the frontier people that will not come home anymore in that there are these you know ferocious um, uh, foes uh, from the other side that are definitely um, forces to be reckoned with right at this point the Alemannic uh, con confederation, but also the Goths were were formidable enemies, right? They were they weren't the uh, you know the Germans of the the time of Augustus that yeah they could ambush the army made um, the made it difficult maybe to to settle in Germany and to to uh, to conquer it stably. He, he, these are sets of tribes that have a consistent cohesion. They're they're deeply Romanized. They know Roman tactics. They they have adapted. Have grown with the example of Rome itself and they know how to deal with it and and yet actually th th this is you know a pretty good testament to th the Constantinian reforms that the, the Empire had managed to to stand against them and to even more dangerous foes such as the Sassanid Persians on on the eastern frontier um, the, the, the Roman legions at this point as we have stressed many times were actually um, a freaking masterpiece, right? Uh, th they weren't at all a uh, declining system, right? The main problem was the supplies of the state. These things were starting really to slowly you know, running out, right? And this was um, the beginning of the end. Well, I don't like this deterministic um, uh, 
sta you know statements as 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 you know but you you can't start see knowing how eventually it's gone that this would lead progressively to a you know a, a knowing going back situation right it would take a very long time as you know I, uh, I I advocate for the fact for the theory that effectively the w not even the Western Roman Empire had to fall in when it did right it could go on had a very few things gone you know in the very last years going differently but there is nothing deterministic as we were saying but we can't read this time in history s as pretending that you know everything was fine after all no there was a crisis and we must acknowledge this one first of all in the politics and the society then the military um, comes as a consequence of those but uh, intrinsically speaking we're we're still talking about an empire that operates a great level and that however needs now more than ever um, consolidation of its um, spiritual currents towards a unique end right and and the gods especially as um, in the campaign of creation were a pretty uh, meaningful symbol in this regard because from one side were perceived as enemies of the empire you know that the gods have we made a lot of videos at this point about the gods and we will keep talking about them because they're terribly terribly fascinating um, and I, I always like to wh when I make these videos to to take a bit the um, the perspective right not the side but the perspective of of all these various uh, policies and, and realizing what they were doing for what right today we, we talk from from the Roman side of the story but uh, in those other videos, we've seen also why these peoples were behaving that way. What was their their yeah? You know, without commanding atrocities and senseless massacres, etc. But realizing that you know politics and society do work in certain ways. You can't ignore to to explain how things go. Um, and the gods were representing here a foreign threat, right? They were the goth was the prototype. The goth was a um, as a name was an ethnographic invention as you understand it was a loose I, I at least believe that it was a loose uh, identity and underlying that this population's but it was f f fairly vague to to tell it all but the gods represented here much more than than our now modern kind of secularized thinking the god at the time was the symbol of uh, of, of a monster of an entity that came from the wilderness of, of the steppes of the of this east where all these uh, terrible peoples uh, had uh, you know terribly terrible and, and fierce and extremely skilled cavalrymen had, had come to subdue from from the east from the rising sun right um, and uh, to to uh, put the world in, in in disarray right and this was a vision that fitted pretty well by the way with the eschatological views of uh, of Christianity like up to that time the world had generally had cyclical vision of, of history like a cycle that repeats over and over again uh, to the infinite uh, uh, the Christianity have a linear uh, I mean the Christians excuse me have a, a linear view of history there is a beginning and creation with an end with the last judgment the uh, the, the kingdom of heaven takes over um, so there is a beginning and an end, right? And this idea of uh, of the end coming through massive destructions, actually through the the affirmation of the Antichrist, right? Eventually will be crushed by the heavenly armies, but is 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 quite uh, there. And and the Roman world in this regard is crumbling to pieces for one specific reason. That is, as we have explained at nauseum uh, at this point, the Roman Empire was founded on a religious principle that was uh, an exquisitely military one, right? Coming, in fact, from those same steps that you know now that the same empire was confronting in in origin. That is the idea that uh, the empire has a. De I mean, the empire is a faculty that com military commanders have that is given by the divinity. Here, it doesn't make any difference if it is a uh, pagan or Christian or whatever divinity. Because at the end of the day, all these peoples believe that there is a God out there. There is 
uh, that maybe uh, the pagan sees that there is a set of gods but there is still a greater force up there usually in the skies that comes in the form of, 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 a, of a cavalryman of a, of, a de- of a fierce deity of war the deity of thunder uh, the deity of, of, of the skies and of, of, of the of the underground uh, at the same time that makes the, the, the earth rumbling under the, the galloping of this terrible cavalryman and and, and Rome is losing, right? And Adrianople, the, the Roman emperor, was slaughtered in the battle, right? The, the Roman army has been annihilated. And the, the moral justification, the religious justification of the empire was solely based on victory, right? The empire exists because it has the right, as long as it, it is powerful, to subdue other people. So if these people come and crush it, uh, this means that the empire is losing uh, the deity's favor, and this is an enormous problem. It poses a, it poses a, a quite specific problem of what kind of deity now can help, because um, there is, of course, a set of values that these um, emperors and commanders and generals must display. Right, the deity doesn't look at cowards and 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 wicked and inf- and inferior. Um, it, it looks at men who have a, 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 a crystalline virtue that is so pure that that only and that only them can effectively gain the celestial glory that belongs to the sky because you know victory belongs does not belong to mortals it always belongs to the, to God or to the gods right there is no way out when when the, the, the general dies uh, is uh, imperium comes back to the skies this is what also in the funeral of the Roman Emperor, uh, you know, right actually happened is that um, the all the the generals threw their their medals and in and uh, you know prizes of war um, to to signify that they're uh, on, on the pyre of, of 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 the of the emperor to signify that all the military glory that they had acquired had derived from from him as a medium of the d- d- deity, right? So what had happened? At Adrianople, the the Roman insignia had been uh, seized. Uh, Rome had lost. Uh, this was a, a, a massive a tra- a trauma and and source of astonishment. How could Roma Invicta be defeated? Were these peoples now the, the deity now is from their side, and therefore we must be wrong for some reason? This is literally how. The populations of the time actually thought like, and this was at every level, right? Uh, this was the the moral mm, paradigm of the time, and as you understand, the, the military uh, side of the story here is fundamental because it's not based on you know how much you accomplish uh, in civil af- uh, affairs, uh, you know how prosperous you are. No, this is literally about the, the the military power that you can display and its effectiveness, whether you win or lose. Right, that's the, the the main the main point, um, and the gods here were something completely different from humanity. Right, there were populations that theoretically could be integrated and had been integrated in part within the same Roman um, borders and army itself. Right, it would be interesting to study at that at, at that level. You know how this was perceived after all. So from from this religious point of view, to integrate the same defeaters of the empire and imperial army, this would become, especially during the the Theodosian times, the major pride of the emperor. The fact that you know. Uh, after the, mm, the defeat of Adrianople, Theodosius had managed to to curb um, uh, the gods to transform them into uh, either Roman soldiers uh, or in um, Roman peasants, right, and to pacify them, and therefore, you know, uh, showing still the, the greatness of Rome that manages not that, that is so merciful that it doesn't when when she wins uh, the barbarians doesn't slaughter them, but also but basically transforms them, makes them repent, and makes them civilized so that they can become Roman uh, Roman subjects themselves, right? Uh, but these peoples are different, right? They, um, they do uh, see their role in the world in a very different way, of course, the Roman uh, do. Um, and especially from a Christian perspective, um, the gods were, were more than just a... Um, foreign threat, but they were also 
uh, enemies of the fate, right? Um, the gods were largely pagan at this time, but formerly their elites were Aryan. Because the the Gothic elites, as yeah, other Germanic peoples, had understood that if they wanted to have a shot in international policy, they had to convert to Christianity, so that they could fit into the Roman Commonwealth in a way or to another. They could settle into Roman lands, um, uh, etc. And uh, but they 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 still retained this different view of of um of essentially of the the, cre the figure of Christ that was more essentially human than divine and the, the balance of of Nicene um uh, orthodoxy that was closer also to their mindset of you know warrior uh, heroism they had all a you know, very uh, personal way of interpreting the, the thing, aside from a strictly doctrinal point of view, this can be observed easily also in how other Germans were progressively converted. Also in the early Middle Ages, they, they had cultural difficulties to, to effectively realize that this was, for example, a peaceful message, right, and that it was substantially diverging from, from their core um, ethical, uh, their core ethos. But, um, so, if they weren't enemies of the cross for the Catholics, ho however they were in, in, uh, the, of in the or for the Orthodox faith, um, so, um, in the gravity of the uh, moment of the invasion, uh, the Milanese bishop uh, was essentially configuring the gods not much as a military threat, right? The Christians are not to be scared by earthly affairs, right? The true Christian should be a martyr of the faith. They sh he should, he or she should be um, massacred uh, before um, refusing uh, his uh, his or her faith. Um, but there is here a metaphysical problem, right? The gods are not just uh, a people in arms that is, is is dangerous for for the integrity. Of of the Roman state, but it's uh, they are substantially um, uh, uh, an enemy of of the ideology are, uh, over which the empire should be built, right? So, in this regard, the Roman state and the Christian Church were looking at the gods, right? As if the scape gods, we could say, you said escape goats, um, as um, you know, a meeting point, right? Having a common enemy that is enemy in, in different ways, right? Because it's a military threat from one, for one side, uh, they're uh, a doctrinal threat from the other. So, uh, church and state can essentially meld together, right? And um, essentially strengthen that bond uh, that had already being formed from the Constantinian times onwards, in fact, between Christianity and empire proper. There were other authors that had stressed such views. We can remember Latantius, for example, this um, Christian writer from the, um, the second half of the third, first half of the 14th, uh, 4th century, um, that was actually a radical ironist. He believed essentially that all um, Christians, aside from their doctrinal divergences, could essentially um, coexist. Uh, th that the, the 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 unity of Christianity itself was more important than its orthodoxy in some ways, right? And he, because he was a pacifist, quite simply, um, that's the point of ironism in the sense that um, there is a um, a general tendency naturally to the pacification of the world. That's the ultimate end of Christianity, I I in theory, right? In ideal, right? Uh, that humanity can't achieve that because it's raked by original sin. There is no way we can do it. But at the same time, he, uh, Latantius himself uh, had preconized that when uh, time would have come, Christ himself would have descended from heavens to guide his people against the force of the evil, right? So here it, it's it's a quite strong vision, right? This is, I would like to stress particularly the role that visions, that 
um, imagination, um, visual imagination have in, in, in the uh, Christian and also non-Christian culture in these times. Uh, these were times in which people had visions, in which were able to sublimate so much their their feelings, their beliefs, in, in the absence of a, a ration, uh, rationalizing system um, to express that their thoughts with a power of imagination that we have lost in many ways. So this figure of Christ is not a, it's a metaphor and not a metaphor, right? Christ himself would have led uh, the heavenly armies against the force of the Antichrist. It, it, it would have been a, a real battle, right? And, and here you could say, well, yes, but it's meant spiritually. Well, it doesn't matter in the fourth century whether this is meant spiritually, uh, I mean metaphorically or um, or really, because uh, people at that time actually believed that that was all one, right? These people truly believed in this, and and they didn't know where the end would come, right? This had been the first question since apostolic times, and 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 Jesus had admonished them. You know, you will hear of a lot of bad things are going to happen, right? Uh, and wars and rumors of wars, but you know, uh, this is the the the, the wisdom in it that is that that is. But don't worry because that's still that's yet not the end, right? And this idea that you know the apostles believed that uh, the second come of Christ would have arrived after a, 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 a few a relatively few times where they they thought it could happen in their lifetime, right? But here the the deep uh, Christian message is that. Um, our world is is doomed by our sins, right? So um, wars and catastrophes and and uh, evil uh, doing and um, and destruction and sufferings and hate um, will happen. It will keep happening, right? And there is nothing you can do about that. And what is important in here is that you shouldn't worry about what will happen in this world because this world does not belong to us we belong to somewhere else and and what happens here is not important you shouldn't care about it you should care for what pertains the earthly matters but you shouldn't care for what concern your spiritual matters that come first than everything because this helps you to deal even with the earthly ones right so it's uh, christianity is not forgetting about what happens right now because you are here to make a difference the the gift of life is aimed at that right is the the strength of love which is able to win the destruction and 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 the evil right and that's um the the cornerstone of christian faith which has a, a sound uh, earthly mandate even though uh, the spring, like the source, is, is somewhere else, and we all belong to somewhere else where we have to to come back to. Um, and uh, the uh, so th this vision is is metaphys is physical and metaphysical at the same time, right? And you cannot think that in front of you know hordes of swarming gods that were you know as we were saying, uh, hell of foes. Uh, you know, imperial filled armies committed all along the Danubian frontier and, and the Rhine against the Alemanni and uh, other peoples pressing from other areas and internal rebellions and usurpations and and famine and uh, uprisings and it, this vision didn't have a quite strong uh, r realistic um, side to it uh, appearance to it right uh, uh, war here uh, is really the key of understanding it all because these events p did pass through violence, did pass through blood, right? And and the whole Christian message does revolve around this. It does revolve around life and death and blood and sufferings, right? So this was a language that spoke directly to the heart of people those times that definitely saw a lot of that at death and a lot of blood, right? And and, and that is what really uh, also explained the success of Christianity in um, in the spread in the masses, but also in this institutional achievements that were to remain as a integrating part of the empire eventually and of you know the Western society. Uh, 
uh, up to this day, um, we do have this heroic tension towards the idea of the struggle, towards the idea of, you know, we exist to this, we have a strength inside of us that, that for which we do not give up. We better die sword in hand than fall to uh, the enemies of our values, of our ideas. This is, this is um, a very powerful foundation for, for a civilization, because if you truly believe in, 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 in good doing, if you really have a sincere um, belief in justice, Right. Always remember this world, which is not um, anecdotal. Justice is really uh, what should balance out all the the wrongdoings and the misdeeds of that that happening here. We we do live uh, in an in unjust world. W w w the w justice does not belong to this world. Right. And this is uh, one of the first uh, Christian principles. In general, you give up every idea that this world can function perfectly. You will never do, and it's foolish to pretend. But still, you can make a lot of difference. Still, right? Always, you know, bearing that uh, you you can't make it right. That yes, the, uh, the the gates of hell will 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 not prevail, right? But uh, this doesn't happen. Um, in in this world, right? It's you. N you need redemption in this world, Wayne. You will not make it alone, and, and that that's also a, a very deep message. Um, but once again, when you see the gates of hell literally opening in front of you, because you look at these people from the steps, and then their cavalry swarming from here to here. At this point, a lot of others would come, right? And this is, yeah, we are at the end of fourth century. These guys are are actually escaping in turn from the Huns, right? So they have they have seen um, uh, the, the, the evil in the face, right? And that's why they're pushing so hard against the Roman frontiers, because they know what happens from the other side, and that, that from the Roman side there is a civilization, right? They have they have understood it. It's, it's also beautiful from, um, you know, a com conversion perspective to, to to believe that even the Germans that had this extremely strong uh, tribal and violent and um, warlike uh, edus that basically permeated the world mindset and costumes had had realized that it was an, a better way to live than that, right? That there was something better you can do of your life than than just spending your life um, uh, as a as a warrior massacring, uh, pillaging and and uh, you know, for for not dying of, of, of hunger, and and that's exactly what um, the Christian model is is promising in some ways, and it, there is this moral redemption that um, that also feels itself committed to the the need of expanding the the, the awareness towards the, the rest of the world. Right, uh, the Christians are not enclosing themselves; they want, um, they feel the need to make a protector and a judge that can reflect divine justice in this world by by certain standards. Um, <coughs> so this was a time, in fact, differently from the time of Latantius, in which finally, at that time in which Christ himself seemed that you know would have descended, seemed to be seemed to be there in the sense that um, the the Roman Vexilla now were displaying the ensigns of, of Christ, while uh, the enemy was barbarian and heretical at the same time. So he was, uh, by by full title, a, a, a double enemy of Rome in this regard. And this seems a, a gluing factor to unify the imperial and the Christian um, uh, intention, direction, aim. Um, so. The problem of of war is a big one in here because you have to justify, as we were saying before, in which circumstances you are allowed now to entrust the state the power to kill in the name of Christianity, right? For protecting the world from evil, right? So this is a big problem because it requires a great work of justification that is not obvious at all, right? Um, and if you look at even the most pacifistic Christian authors, um, there is at least one type of war that is justified 
they're justified. That is the last of wars, right? And uh, and we're talking naturally about the apocalypse in which um, Christ wants it, right, and guides it, um, and and it's in here that Ambrose can uh, exactly ensure to his imperial interlocutor Gratian that that time has come and that that war is holy right and this is I, I care very much about this because we made a lot of videos about the Crusades and there is all this debate what, what, what is a religious war and a holy war and a thing right the, the peculiarity of the Crusades is often mistaken as if before there weren't holy wars but you know if you look at the world in the fourth century can you identify which people didn't fight in the name of a religion because if that's the discriminant uh, I mean we are I mean it's obvious that er each one of these people were, were was justifying every kind of military action according to their cultural beliefs right it's something that we we keep doing in fact it's not religion the discriminant in itself we all believe that there is a rightness at some point to to use violence in a certain way and it's not uh, an hypocritical problem because you really do need violence in the world how do you pacify society without violence how do you protect people without violence right um, uh, pacifistic uh, takes on, on reality are delirious right uh, that, well, how can you defend your family and, um, and and the people around you if you you pretend that you have to be passive towards that and but this was a problem in Christian terms because as we have seen the use of violence um, in the Bible and also in the evangelic message is actually ambiguous, right? The idea is that Christianity is pacific, but definitely not pacifistic. Like, there, by definition, there cannot be a, a pacifist Christian. Like, it's a, an oxymoron, right? You, you can't be, right? Christians are peaceful, but advocating for pacifism means to basically give up the responsibility that God has given you with the set of options that you have at your disposal politics in potential has always and must have fortunately the chance of using violence because that is what can do good to save other people pacifism in is an extremely first of all violent and but also radically dangerous ideology in this regard uh, but the problem is still felt because ideally right there is an ideal humanity is done for you know, with the original sin you can't do anything about it but still the church at this point says okay but this is in fact what happens in on earth but what is what should be the principle towards which humanity should tend right what would christ do in other words so in here naturally there can't be an open way of saying you can use violence but at the same time, um, and here the civilization and, and the great construction and work that the ecclesiastical elites put at this point, and why Ambrose is so important, uh, there, there had to be um, a, a, a counterweight right, to say, okay, we, we still sin when we kill, but we must conceive and hear simply how much we have saved, how many lives, including and especially, we have saved. Um, in order to to act violently to prevent it, and and that is the real the real question. Um, and 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 Ambrose uses certain um, different um, rhetorical tools, right? It, here we're talking also about very, I mean, at this point, the Christian elites have reached the, the top. These have the the full uh, set of classical education of the, the pinnacles of of the ancient world, right? They're um, and um, and, uh, and Ambrose does not use uh, the Apocalypse, but the book of Ezekiel, right? And in the defeat of Gog, right? Um, he uh, associate the term to Gothus. Um, th th this is very fascinating because um, it, it was not new, right? The uh, Ambrose refers to the Goths, the prophecy of Ezekiel himself, right, on the invasion of Gog that he sees in the Gotus on the Goth. Um, and he actually sees that this is written in the, the Fide uh, 216. And he uh, sees in the divine punishment culminated 
to the Aryan balance, right, that had been slaughtered at Adrianople. This is very fascinating because here you have the Roman Emperor, so here is the same guy that is at the top of the institution that you're trying to win, but he is an Aryan. So he is um, an enemy of the fate that is basically killed by the same akin to him, another Aryan, right, uh, by the Goth, such. So the identification, by the way, of Gog, uh, Gog with the Goths, um, that is naturally incentivated by the assonance of the names, was um, was current at the time, like in the fourth century, when these uh, you know from the third fourth century that the Goths had become this major mm, protagonist uh, in the international picture. But it's something actually older than that. For example, Flavius Josephus had already applicated it to the Scythians, right? If you look at the Antiquitatis Judaicae uh, 161, you find the same. And this is very fascinating because you see in the Jewish and in the Roman world alike that the this Hellenistic world at this point, uh, that uh, the peoples of the steppes, like the Scythians first, then the Sarmatians and the Goths, are uh, that uh, monstrous people, right, of the scripture that uh, is conceived as the uh, divine punishment for uh, the, the man's sins, right? So it's not, uh, it's not just a, um, you know, a, a also a, a Judeo-Christian uh, symbology here, because objectively the, these peoples of, of the steppes were always seen a bit in that light from the sedentaries of Europe as, you know, look at those monsters that basically uh, have a, a world upside down, right, for, for many points of view, they had been pictured stereotypically as the, you know, those who behaved in the contrary to what the civilization should be, right. So, um, and, and, and the beauty of Ambrose's work is that he looks e at, at the defeat of the gods, right, as to the end of the barbarian nightmare and the triumph of the Christianissimum Princeps Gratian, right? So this is, uh, once again, a, a universal power uh, that takes over the military faculty of delivering uh, Christianity itself, in fact, from this threat, right? From so. Um, um, there is the avail, there is the legitimization of the use of violence to preserve the ecumenic empire here in the name of God. And so this definitely continues and intensifies the process of embracing of imperial sacrality within the uh, harbor of the new faith Right, and also presents this new binomium, the assimilation Gog Goddess, that is conceptually the demonization of the enemy, right? The sublimation of war from the historical to the metaphysical clash, right, between good and evil. This immense clash, right? A clash that, in fact, in, in uh, involves the whole world. Here, Rome was the center of the world, and these peoples came from the outside, from this terrible, um, you know, non place, yet to be civilized, yet to be, uh, you know, converted, of course, and that was pushing against, uh, as a chaotic force, against the order of, of the divinely inspired empire. And this is a concept that, once again, is not only, it's not a Christian prerogative. This idea is to be found also in paganism, like the idea that the celestial deity of the sky is perfect and it brings harmony to the world thanks to the sword is there. You find it in all the mythologies. You find it in the Hellenic one, in the Germanic one. It, it, it's there. It's uh, a patrimony of all Indo-Europeans, and not only, right, also other peoples have this. And 
And therefore, when we look at the fourth century, we say, well, uh, Christianity arrived, it brought this new thinking, this new way of uh, looking at the enemies of... Uh, it was not um, original, if not in this deeper ethical responsabilization of the political actors of such, uh, you know, of such clash, of such struggle. Um, so that actually the military side of the story here was prevailing, right? Uh, this was a concession in other ways that the Christians were making to this enormous cultural legacy brought by paganism and the, I would say, the natural um, the natural ethos that belonged even to the Ju Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, Christianity naturally brought something new, essentially new on the table, right? Of course, Christianity was influenced by other currents, not just even by Judaism. There was a lot in the genesis of Christianity that uh, drew from an immense background that went beyond uh, the same, uh, if you want, still tribal character of, of Western civilization, bec because that's that's truly the point. I mean, the, the Romans had never f fully surpassed this. The, the 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 concept that this is really all about war. The Romans were a, a military um, uh, state. That there is no other way to see it. And uh, largely speaking, actually, all the other empires had been that had had aimed at that. Even the smallest tribe of the periphery of Europe w was thinking essentially the, the same thing that as long as you they won in battle it's because you know they had the right to vanquish and to subjugate the uh, the defeated right and that they were bigger superior the, the, they were entitled to that right so here Christianity brings another concept that is of course uh, accepting that um, the religion must be founded uh, in a uh, in a in an earthly dimension, uh, in the way the church is right. So uh, humanity uh, lives in this world. We can't ignore that. But at the same time, it adds to the this you know w waging of violence a um, a justification that is not simply. Um, contractualistic that is to say okay let's bet we will win because you know uh, we think th we have the quality to do that and there was definitely a spirituality in paganism as well in this regard but it was based fundamentally on a um, on a military character right even if um, on an explicit military character even if the concept of virtue in this regard was deeper in some sense but um, th this is kind of complicated actually we should explain it better because it's uh, especially at this point Roman civilization had absorbed so so much of other philosophies and I um, and uh, the same religions actually that, that it's it's difficult to speak simplistically in these terms but um, here with Christianization of the Empire there is the acknowledgement of the necessity of such um, uh, let's say confrontation between the, the spiritual side as a, as a thing that is does not belong to the earth um, I, in in uh, and and that is superior to it right it is uh, absolutely superior to it infinitely if you want and what happens on earth um, and it's complicated because even within the same church uh, the word very different cultures in this regard right um, the secular clergy and uh, I don't know monks were two very different things they had two very different views of the world and what the church should be and what the ideal should be and it turns out that actually the, the, the secular clergy uh, at one point was more uh, far-sighted than than the, the ascetics, than the you know the the idealists, if you want, and this is normal because in a society normally there is a bulk of you know pragmatic and rationalistic, uh, uh, you know majority. Let's put it in this way, and then this fringes of idealism and of extremism, if you want, if you want here. Ambrose is not an extremist. He's, uh, he he uh, says that killing is a sin and it's monstrous. It's against um, divine will. But at the same time, in this world, there is something greater 
then the the action of killing in itself there is a value that uh, that exists in defending the weak uh, in defending the poor in defending those who cannot defend themselves and that's that the real point and this um, by the way we'll see it now but it implies an enormous burden on the shoulders of politics and of the military right here if you are a Christian politician or a Christian soldier uh, you you, st you must acknowledge that um, there is a beyond to what you have been used to believe that, that exists right and beware that it wasn't that simple to to spread this like if you look even at I don't know there is a beautiful study about 7th century uh, Byzantine soldiers um, military edus basically I mean they were demonstrating that <laughs> that they had the same military edus of a pagan right of an early imperial soldier of a you know a classical hoplite right <laughs> rather than of a or even more actually because the hoplite uh, generally um, by rule the despised military activity here we're talking about really a, a military edus that didn't seem to have much of um, you know, a regret towards bloodshed and things like that so even about the alleged loss in combativity of Christian armies that's <laughs> that's quite quite you know quite of a joke I would say um, but aside from this that's that's the point I would like to stress that if the miles Christi of the first Christian times served in the army of a sovereign whose reign was not of this world right now that the church and the empire were basically to to approach and to intertwine and to confuse themselves if not to m melt to, to overlap in their respective destinies well, the Milites Christi, the Christian soldiers, w will de facto overlap uh, those um, soldiers of the empire that, uh, under the um, insignia consecrated by the Christian symbols, fight against an enemy that assumes even diabolical features, right? Mm. Remembering here always even the, the the visionary dimension, the visual imagination of this um, uh, peoples, right? Th these were felt as as monsters for for real, lit quite literally, right? And I mean, Roman literature stresses the differences between uh, the Romans and the Germans even too much, which actually was a, a specifically Roman thing to do because they had to pretend that they were even slightly physically inferior to to prove that they were you know morally superior right that was the idea but there wasn't much of a difference actually between but you know when the Huns arrived you know these were people that actually looked different and they were living differently and once again they were really something external on that point right he did the same thing these are devils substantially and they're demonized as such as enemies of the empire and of the church um so and when the gods are crushed actually um well the true christ um slash commander announced by latantius uh, has not descended on the earth because evidently the world has not ended but there is however and for this reason in ambrose's view his own representative the christianissimum Princeps Divino Electus Judice, which means the most Christian prince elected by divine judgment. That is to say, Gratian had uh, was not just chosen by God in this sense as, you know, the, the random ruler of the world. Like when Jesus says, you know, give back to Caesar what is of Caesar and give to God what is of God this is something very different now because this is now a Christian king 
it's, it's the same king of the scriptures, right? Um, and uh, it's even more now. It's properly an emperor because the Christian message, differently from the biblical one, is 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 um, you know uh, open to to the wall. Is 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 extended to the wall humanity, right? Not just to the Jews or who, however, behaves exactly uh, according to the law. Um, this is this ne really need uh, takes an ecumenic dimension. Uh, it, it really takes a her an earthly dimension so even the military uh, I mean the, the justification of violence here is based on the uh, Christomimesis in the idea that uh, there is a, a reflection of the universal empire um, e uh, of God in the universal empire and that the emperor is the medium and once again stressing here what um the empire uh, what the emperor himself represents the emperor remains here the medium between god and the earth and as such he's a ruler of the earth here with christianization the imperial character the military character the, the empire proper of the state proper does not disappear because gratian is in command of imperial armies and these are the armies now of God and of the universal empire and it's worth to stress this point also from a pagan perspective again why because um, you know let's start from this from in, in thir 381 the council of Aquileia uh, having made its own a well the roots of which could be found in the even in the sand poles concept of uh, civil power right in this uh, in these works on the apologetics that mm, you know established officially the prayers for the health of the emperor this was important but we, we made a video about St. Paul and the Militia Christi right and but you know that the Pauline uh, message essentially exhorts to obey to earthly authorities generally speaking this is an important Judaic uh, legacy in Christianity that it, it is you know you you don't have literally to uh, accept everything that um, the secular authorities do right because the Jews were you know also living outside of the you know they were living in Rome and there were many communities scattered even you know before the uh, the destruction of the temple so naturally these Jewish communities had their own uh, religion they uh, which they practiced also they had to cope with the local authorities and there was the sense that you know if you obeyed to local rules and you know the, the Jews were generally an obedient people um, generally will <laughs> erase the, you know, the Jewish revolt against Rome but that's another thing um, yeah but generally speaking the Jews were were uh, you know uh, also actually a dem uh, are, um, demanded presence somewhere because they dealt with with important uh, affairs um, that they were educated, uh, etc., um, and they they generally obeyed, like, and they had this reverence towards local authorities that they could, in fact, protect them and mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so mm, the mm, there was also the prayer for the salus of the emperor. This was also done by pagans normally. Right, and it was the acceptance of praying. In fact, even from a Judeo-Christian Christian perspective, for the um, for the pagan emperor, because the idea was that where he is, he's been placed here by God, and therefore, if he rules on earth, has uh, uh, an uh, an authority that you know, where another derives from God, or at least it's part of his uh, plan, and you have to be mindful of it. And this is a in my opinion it's a very beautiful message it's a very uh, positive and constructive attitude towards I mean you can disagree with this person beliefs and you can uh, and you definitely must maintain your own if you have them if you truly believe them um, in them uh, it's your right but at the same time it should be a concord there should be uh, you know a cooperating society right which again is a very um, good way of you know of, of, of coexisting and um, 
On the other hand, um, Christianity, however, goes beyond this, right? Christianity is not entirely, uh, you know, in, in its concrete application, uh, uh, positively acting, right? The, uh, there are unfortunate events that are taking place uh, with the affirmation of Christianity that have to do with the same persecutions, right? With the, uh, the idea that uh, this will be more evident in the future because, you know, the affirmation of Christianity was pretty soft. You have to, to wait, uh, in fact, this times, and especially, but also later on, think about Justinian, uh, this would, the Iron Fist, the exclusion of other cults, or at least their emargination, um, and the destruction also of temples, of, um, you know, other symbols of pagan, religion this happened um, and this happened at an institutional level but more generally it happened um, wherever you know there was a struggle between the pagans and the Christians which was which was occurring as actually it happened also within the same pagan world like between uh, groups of uh, different um, I don't know temples sanctuaries it wasn't at all a peaceful world um, the, the our idea modern idea of tolerance was very you know, uh, far to to come, um, and um, and naturally now the Christians were backed by the state, so the state normally let them do uh, even disdainful things. Indeed, they were criticized sometimes by the same Christians that were saying, you know, okay, these are pagans, but you know, mind what you're doing, right? Because once again, if you kill someone, uh, you're a sinner anyway. But you know, we we know how things go uh, in with every. Um, you know that uh, every idea can be an excuse to do something bad. It, it, that the difference is what you do as a person, as an individual. This is what also, in fact, Christianity is advocating. So, um, uh, the, the after all, the Roman Empire had imposed uh, the recognition, the tribute, the the sacrifice to to the emperor. Right, and this had triggered the persecution against the Christians that were killed uh, uh, in in part, but also the, the Roman authorities tried to be. I mean, some persecutions were very violent, telling the truth, but you know, after all, they were contained. Now the Christians were essentially doing the, ser the same thing, um, in part also in a in a more capillar way, uh, but still there was a lot of syncretism after all. And you can't reduce these suppressions of pagan cults just as you know. It was a matter of faith, right? It was also a matter of a lot of interests, and I mean a lot of interests. And generally speaking, you know, uh, well, maybe we'll discuss it on another occasion, but you, you understand here we, we're trying to, to be objective about both sides because, you know, there were, there were both good and bad people in, 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 like in every group, historically speaking. And, and, and this is also not certainly a way to to get away with with the actual crimes that were committed and the atrocities that were committed um, but uh, th there is one point in in this process that is very very important that is right after the council of uh, Aquileia were as we've seen the um, um, the 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 approval of the Church towards the empire had been sanctioned also from a you know political side um, in, in terms of general approval towards imperial action etc uh, as a evident support even to certain policies of the empire. Gratian, uh, in exchange, um, which had been uh, demanded by the Christians evidently, renounced officially to the title and insignia of Pontifex Maximus. That, as you know, in the Roman religion, was the, um, uh, it was the highest magistracy, actually, um, associated chiefly to religious function, even if basically every magistracy was associated with, but the Pontifex Maximus had, had a, a, a greater um, um, authority in that sphere. Um, and the... Um, also, he annulled the expenses of the pagan cult, right? That sustained the, the those offices, um, the priesthood, uh, the pagan priesthood, and all the associated rites, etc. Right. So now, at least they had to pay them for, for by themselves, and the state didn't have to pay any more for it. And also, very importantly, very meaningfully, and that's where we what we want to stress. 
the removal of the uh, Victoria, right? So the sta statue of, of victory, of the deity of victory, in the uh, from the Curia Iulia uh, in Rome. Now this was um, a powerful, especially. I mean, th these are all important changes, right? Because you you take away uh, the most important figure of um, you know of the Roman religion um, in from from the magistracies. You um, you stop paying for the public rights, right? Which means that you you're renegating the gods of the old religion. This is just looking at it in perspective. I mean, the Christians had been persecuted because they they hadn't tributed, in fact, those mm, sacrifices to the emperor. Now, the state was saying, "Okay, we don't even want to perform those rites anymore, right?" Um, because we're back to Christians, and the removal of the victory from the Curia is very very meaningful because first of all, the Romans believed naturally that these statues were not just mere ornaments. They truly believed that this was at least a tribute to the deity in itself. It was a, you know, um, a contact between the, 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 the sacrum and the, uh, the, the object that represented the same off, uh, offer and you know, recognition and respect towards the victory. Now, why the removal of the victory from the Curia? Right, because if you think about it, uh, you know, victory was needed anyway, right? Now, not as a goddess, not as a deity to worship, because now the empire was essentially uh, on, on the way to become Christian uh, officially, so it was just one god you have to pray to. Um, but the... Um, the symbol here naturally has many other political meanings uh, towards the, the, the Senate, the, 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 arist the aristocracy, that the senatorial aristocracy is still largely pagan. There is the need of also, you know, shifting power from certain um, milieus to, to others. So it, it, the, the problem is complex, but it's obvious that this has an important a symbolic but also practical meaning in some way. Um, you don't abandon victory so easily, um, especially after that. Probably um, most of your army still, maybe still being Christian, actually believed in um, in the old traditions, or at least in this, you know, kind of superstitious idea that okay, yeah, we're Christian, but you still, you know, get every religion deity that we want because actually how. Christianity uh, emerged was like this, like the Christian God was simply uh, adopted in the pagan pantheon like the others, right, albeit, you know, misunderstood in some way, but it was just one of the many from a strict, what we'd call polytheistic perspective, but, you know, the term polytheistic in itself is a monotheistic um, word that didn't exist before monotheism as such, because it was normal to have many, many gods together, right? Um, so, here it's obvious, the, the meaning is obvious in itself, the logic behind it should be investigated a little bit. The, the meaning is naturally that we don't believe in that specific deity anymore, because it's as if the, the deity of victory was, was a, a lesser one. It was actually an emanation of a greater deity, and now that greater deity, the absolute deity, was the, the Christian one. And you didn't need any other um idol fundamentally as it was called perceived in, th in that perspective um, so but if you look at Gratian right so let's look at the figure also of these emperors that are at this time very borderline in terms of wh wh who are these people right are they Christian I mean for real uh, do we know that well of course we don't right um, and uh, we we can make s hypotheses about it but it's probably never about like this guy was either a Christian and nothing else, or it was uh, simply pagan, right? It was a hybrid, right? There was a synchrosis, naturally, between these beliefs. Um, as we have seen, if you look at the same uh, Julianus, um, 
he you know he was uh, at all he wasn't at all trying to restore the old roman archaic religion he was he was essentially an Ellen, an Hellenist who believed in enotheistic formed this idea of you know a solar cult with a you know central deity and then its emanation also an eastern influence so it was a very different thing and you can spot in here the the, the gradu the graduality of this process like of how easy after all it was to integrate these new cults on the to graft them in on the pre-existing um, set of, of 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 beliefs that now you know if you were to interpret if you were to interpret it psychologically or emotionally speaking you you it's as if you need to put a lot of order or or on a very chaotic system you know you have so many gods now you don't there is no <laughs> orientation anymore about them so you you need to form this hierarchy and, and naturally this hierarchy uh you know heads towards the the creation of a of major deity right and and you but the per look at the persians look at um think about um the manichaeism or these were melanges of uh you know the most different uh, the most diverse religion including christianity itself by the way uh that had spread in other areas and transformed right so um this is an interesting point, but the idea, the core idea, at the base of this, is that after all, right, all this modern picture that we have of the many gods in a kind of a categorized fashion did, hadn't quite existed in the past. Like, I don't know wh when I when I went to school, the idea is that you learned, I don't know, that the ancient Greeks had those gods, so you learn about Zeus, you learn about. Athena, Ares, and all this stuff, right? But if you were to look at that from, you know, an Hellenic, you know, classical Hellenic perspective, basically every uh, Hellenic city-state had a, a different religion, right? They had certain deities in common that were essentially entities more than actually that, that eventually were canonized historically, also for literary reasons, but that. The same goes for the Romans, right? The Romans had a religion on their own that was extremely primitive and about which we know basically anything, right? Um, but that was there. It was dramatically similar, in fact, to the, the same one uh, even the Celts and uh, yeah, know, other peoples in Europe had. That there was based on the perception of all these various forces. and it was uh, They were at the borderline with animism in, in some ways as well. Um, and it's complicated to talk about those forms of spirituality. The point here is, however, that there had always been, a, as we were saying before, a celestial deity, especially in the Indo-European pantheon, there was the uh, the deity of, of thunderbolt, of the sky, of war, right? And it's always the same thing at the, at the end of the day. So that uh, there is a pan in the european uh, mm, vision of the of, of the universe uh, in this regard let's call it in this way that uh, that is in fact beyond the religion strictly meant it, it's really more uh, an interpretation of the world that is very difficult to to, to grasp from our mindset is definitely very far from, from that one but once again the idea is that if you get rid of victory victory is the personification of of the in fact it's it's difficult to to even explain it o of the victory in itself right and it, it of 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 the victory emanated in this regard from something else from the fact that you earned this victory through the divine glory that has been given to you the complicated symbolism think about the 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 wings uh, of victory the the analogy with the roman eagle with the uh, the animal sacred to Jupiter, right, and all the, the, the celestial symbolism and, and, and so on. So it's all emanation. If you look at Gratian, he was called the Alan, right? Not because he was Alan, but because of the love that he had towards his bodyguard. There was Alan, right? They, they were Alans. The Alans were uh, essentially a Sarmatian tribe that were also the uh, regarded as the uh, as the toughest, and uh, they were the easternmost, the closest, in fact, to the costumes of the steppes, the ones that were described by Roman authors as these 
um, iron men because they were covered from head to toe with this uh, fish scale armor that reflected also in here we should talk about that but only in the mythology of those people so where's this deity of war that were covered in iron that represented all these traditions of metallurgy and associated with the shamanic trance that you find also I don't know, in the European traditions of this frenetic uh, world of the un uh, under uh, you know in the underworld but also to the skies that were associated with with mounted combat with these cataphracts as a matter of fact that you know that are the symbols of you know the dominators of of the world um, driven from the skies but uh, working with this underworld strengths of, of the horse uh, um, and of the metals of the armor that were typically uh, chthonic symbols um, and 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 therefore and, and the islands were considered as first of all they had been enemies of Rome in the past and then by certain standards that some were, were still uh, so so um, this is the time in which the Roman emperors have substantial had always had it but uh, at this point even more exotic um, uh, bodyguards let's say that uh, uh, definitely in the case of Gratian were, were picked among one of the toughest peoples in absolute terms that were that the Romans had had mapped um, up to that time they were famous exactly because of this uh, proximity if you want to the values to the core ethical values of the steps and, and therefore the spring of those same Indo-European mentality of the um, of the uh, of the warrior on the horseback right uh, many people believe that the Romans were were all about infantry but in the Roman military uh, mindset um, the the true man was a horseman was a knight like the Equites had special privileges is also politically speaking the, R the Romans fought uh, with infantry for specific political social reasons for you know uh, the structuration of you know the empire in the way it had been but their mindset was still if you want in the steps they didn't know that they didn't rationalize it, but basically all these European peoples had come from the same the same spring look at all the ancient Roman legions look at the, the symbolism also of the uh, in the names in the uh, even in the aspect of the color of their hair or their eyes, it, they, they all come straight from the Caucasian, from the from the Aryan tradition, and and therefore the islands represented now the uh, the most absolute military value that you could find everywhere. And uh, obviously, Gratian was very proud about his bodyguard in this regard. Um, and so much that in fact he even used to wear the same uh, ethnic, uh, the same yeah traditional clothes of his members, right? Um, and you say, but wait a minute, Th this is the person who had destroyed the victory, uh, the symbol of victory in the Korea, and was you know essentially embracing now Christianity, but uh, still pretending to be basically uh, part of the same of the most warrior and the most irreversibly pagan uh, military elite o o of um, uh, of the steppes uh, and it's equestrian hence uh, ma uh, military traditions uh, what's the deal here well my interpretation here is that he actually um, was thinking still in a fully pagan sense you know at least in a fully contractualistic way Right. The idea is that the empire had been crushed at Adrianople, and that it had been crushed while, okay, Valens was an Aryan, okay, but still that world had been had been backed, had been um, also supported by that same pagan elite that believed in victory in the old customs, etc. Now, so these emperors wanted essentially to radically change what the balance of power was. They wanted to be autocrats, they wanted to be monarchs, they wanted to enforce the military nature of their government. They wanted to emulate, if you want, the, the great shiftings of the steps you could find among these uh, Iran Iranic peoples that um, essentially were solely militarily based in terms of authority. And this authority stemmed still, however, from God, from from the celestial deity of the sky. 
Hence, the study of victory represented, in my opinion, to Gratian, uh, the old tradition of the old republic, I mean, the, the senators in, in some ways, right? Of course, there was no po republic anymore, but, I mean, the idea that there was still a um, some form of democratic power that stemmed from the idea that the Romans were in charge, the people of the Romans, but where had the Romans been here? The Romans had been defeated on the field of Adrianople. Um, by the Visigoths that, however, had also Ostrogothic and Alan cavalry on the field, right? Um, that were the ones that eventually crushed the Roman army, um, attacking them on the flank. The, the Romans in Adrianople, we don't know, there was a, you know, they, they, they simply didn't act because the, the, the Roman army was a formidable thing, right? It's just that the, the, the chain of command in that battle went to, you know, lost somewhere we we don't know and it was a total disaster um, but the idea those riders of the steps that were coming from where the Visigoths were coming so from the trans Danubian areas from this steps that basically opened themselves as, uh, from Istria in fact to the, the Scythia and where all these um, peoples were pouring from in the steps pushing from the um, escaping from the Hunnic migration the Hunnic storm uh, well, the idea is that those had gained the victory. So the victory of Rome in the Curia Iulia was worthless at that point. It could be removed. What now was needed was the absolute god, right? Uh, an absolute form of deity, right? That obviously the Alans were not Christians, but Christianity provided the empire with the sense that um, the state now was in full charge of the military action. Um, that's why St. Ambrose is so important, because this choice for, for this emperor um, probably exalted Gratian's, um, um, you know, dream of, 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 of command and of, and of, and of conquest and of, of, of success against the gods, right? That proved with victory true victory, not a statue, but a victory on the battlefield, in a bath of blood, Bu was in, in charge there, right, and stressing the, uh, the true imperial power, the imperium as a religious principle, as it was truly, m more truly conceived in, in, you know, in archaic Rome, in, in the, the midst of, you know, of history slash mythology of the, the, the tribal in uh, you know, warrior, uh, warlike mentality that the Romans had had um, if from from that specific origins that made them close a step closer to the islands than what the w they were now in said in the fourth century. So, I think this is a big, big um, symbol, right? Uh, not a denial of the pagan values in the name of Christianity, but the reinforcement of the military character thanks to the backing of Christianity itself. In 389, in that work, um, the Deoficis, that was destined to become in the following centuries one of the uh, fundamental ethical political works of Christianity, Ambrose chose a high eulogy in honor of whom would have committed himself for the fatherland, um, considering this like uh, uh, you know great, uh, the the greatest actually work of justice, right? This this is very important. You can find this in um, um, the Officius Minister uh, Ministrorum, in fact, uh, sixteen. And this work is very important because it would become, thanks especially to the work of Bernard of Clairvaux, about whom we, we made some video, one of the basic texts for chivalric ethics in the Middle Ages and for the Crusades themselves, right? So justifying, even in that case, um, the Christian military action, right? So Christian violence as necessary for the defense of the Societas Christiana. Um, so you see in here that Ambrose is fully backing um, the military um, instrument as actually one of the greatest um, sacrifices, I would say, 
in the name of God, right? The idea that if you participate, if you go to war to defend your fatherland, you're essentially um, uh, doing probably one of the greatest um, sacrifices. You're sacrificing your own life, as a matter of fact, for for the faith, right? So is a is a great privilege and a great honor, but also a great duty. Right, so you as a soldier, now we know in that time how many people actually tried to escape the levy because the military was, an, an, um, once you entered, you didn't come out of it anymore um, at that time. And uh, the Roman emperors had to enforce all those recruitment laws because, you know, uh, also there were a, a fewer people, so <laughs> it was even more difficult to find uh, than they, they even escaped. But um, so this is also a deep political uh, support to the authority to who is effectively in charge of political and military affairs. And to underline further this new sacral bond between church and empire, because this is really now a religious thing, um, the end of the fourth century is in fact the time of certain late canonizations of military saints that were perceived now as new models for the new age. What does this remember you? These are This is the threshold of the Middle Ages, right? Uh, in the fourth century now, uh, not only Christianity gets fully now with the uh, Edict of Thessalonica, the religion of state of the empire, but also in this regard backs military prerogatives also through a geography. Military saints come on the fore once again, and yes, it stressed their original sacrifice in the military, for the military, but uh, in a very different way from what the original one was, right? The first one was essentially Christians that were forcibly conscripted in the Roman army, were refused, or at least that uh, actually, the, you know, the, that converted while they were within the army to Christianity and they refused to shed blood, right? So they actually, that's very interesting because they, they were, they didn't refuse the army in itself as an institution, but they refused to kill, right? Um, this is something that uh, exists still today. I mean, there are people who join the military, but they say, I, I can't kill because m my religion forbids me to do it, but um, so that's quite interesting, and that still comes from a Judeo-Christian matrix because it, it acknowledges the fact that the military is a political instrument that um, therefore is employed by an authority you have to obey, right? Because it's being put here by God and you're also part of it in one way or another. Like Christians born in the Roman Empire, just think about, you know, St. Paul, it was a Jew actually, and then converted into Christianity, but you know, they were Romans and Christians, so they had a mixed allegiance, if you want. Like the early Christians, then eventually the church stressed the, 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 the clash, you know, the struggle between the persecutions, etc. But most Christians of the early times were actually fine with being Christians, but also sacrificing to the emperor. It was not a big deal. During the time of the persecutions, there were certain bishops who also quite intelligently said, okay, yes, uh, sacrificing to the emperor is a sin, but if the alternative is getting killed, well, just do it and then, you know, pay some, you know, uh, atone yourself, uh, pay a penance, but, you know, don't get yourself killed. Or th think about your family, think about... Um, here, the paradigm is, is shifted again because you have that the military saints become not just, you know, the model of that citizen... Mm, you know, secular citizen challenged on, on a spiritual ground, but still recognizing the political authority. But th they become actually protectors of the military, which is something very different. That is, you know, a person that is being martyrized for for having not want to kill the, his f fellow men now becomes the protector of people that by profession kill other people. That is the military, right? And that's the, the that's a profession. There is nothing bad in it, right? Once again, it depends what you're killing those people for. Because shooting down a terrorist that is threatening to, to kill innocent people is a righteous thing to do, right? It may be a sin to kill anyway, but you're doing something good in killing that person.
because that person in that moment must be killed it's not a matter of what you think what is good or not you must do it and that's the social collective responsibility that individuals like Ambrose were advocating in this in fact pretty dangerous moment for for the Empire right but it opens as you understand to um, a different view of the world and to a um, to a, a deep union in fact of, of church and state as essentially double face of, of the same metal of, of, of the Empire meant in fact both um, spiritually and secularly or ecclesiastically and secularly if you prefer. Um, so I it's the fear of the end and let's also not underestimate this aspect this is the awaiting of for the palingenesis the second come of Christ right they thought the apocalypse was near right that was uh, when we will talk about Saint Augustine eventually and also in the fifth century we will see it better with the sack of Rome um, you know but um, it's obvious that there was um, um, even at this point a, a shattering of what the basis and the Empire uh, had been um, and it's around this uh, waiting for the end th this fear this inner tension these are tormented times that revolve the burning reality of the um, Christian Roman Empire that was you know um, str um, in trouble was troubled by the external barbarian uh, danger and the internal social crisis right so these are not things you have you can't kid about and it was natural therefore that the language of the time would be of apocalyptic type right and that the symbols of the spiritual struggle could find on the um, historical and social level an immediate and quite precise um, check right you you uh, once again uh, think at the people of that world you you don't know what physics is you don't know modern science you you see these things happening there were also much fewer people I mean things um, were seen were were people were living within this danger right uh, misery was a real thing right today we live in an opulent society Th that was nothing like it so the p deprivations sufferings uh, were much more accentuated in the lives of people who had a life expectancy of in fact of uh, you know they, 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 they were lucky to survive well, one third of the kids died normally then if you were lucky you could arrive to your 60s or 70s but that was like a you know already a big achievement right but life was miserable in many ways and especially there were ever more poor people right uh, uh, fewer uh, richer people and en enormous masses of disinherited of, of emarginated that had no other option but basically sav you know sacrificed their individual freedom to go work as colonists in some um, senators uh, latifundium uh, in order to, to to give something to eat to their family in the first place so y w and in all this wars uh, civil wars so not even just ah oh no now the gods arrive or the Alemanni arrive but actually the, the toughest blows were coming from the within right from the same Roman usurpers and um, you know and all the civil wars that followed from that and it is in fact one major event from a military point of view in 394 on the banks of the Frigidus River in the Venezia Iulia, northeastern Italy, that the uh, Bora, the catabatic wind, disrupted the troops of the pagan anti emperor Eugenius, right, and that assigned victory to the Christian Theodosius, Theodosius the Great, the one who the emperor would reunify. Uh, east and west for the last time now this was a prodigious event right um, it was a sign a f 
firm sign, standing sign of divine favor. Uh, the battle of Phrygia was was bloody, like hell. Right, it was a massive clash. Right? The, the Roman army suffered, you know, uh, consistently. Nevertheless, it was a decisive victory for Theodosius and for Catholicism with him. Um, it was the reunification of the empire. So once again, uh, victory, whatever your perspective you want to take, the pagan, the Christian one, doesn't matter. It's always that the, that God has blessed the winner. Hence, the winner has the right to rule over this immense reunited territory. And the uh, the the episode of the bar uh, of the catabatic uh, wind is is fascinating. That this this very cold wind that blows from the north, and the head, uh, you know, only in the face of 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 the of the of the pagans, right? Of the anti-emperor, of the rebel, of the usurper. So this was interpreted actually as the same miracle of the uh, legio fulminata right that had taken place and you can still see uh in rome uh on the uh, antonine column right uh during the wars fought by marcus aurelius in in germany in, in one of those years in 172 173 um uh, the, the, there is this you know representation of jupiter a on a over a quadriga that is in in the act of you know throwing this thunderbolt um, um, against a siege tower that the the barbarians have apparently uh, built, and 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 this has a uh, it's associated to the, the miracle of the of of the rain as well. But uh, the one of the thunderbolt is actually more important in my opinion. The one of the rain is more famous, but and that also what gave the name to the twelfth legion. Fulminata literally will detain the, the thunderbolt as the symbol in here as the major symbol of the celestial deity of the sky, right? That, that really crashes everything, right? The symbol together with the eagle that is the only bird that looks straight at the the sun in the sky and therefore can see the gods, can reach the gods. Uh, it's the dual symbol, of religious symbol em of the empire. But well, this was repeated with the wind that basically there's another force of nature that had. Of, of the air of the sky that had crushed the pagans in a in a military engagement and and this is interesting because um Theodosius as you know is responsible for the f formal christianization of the empire you know and that becomes a religion of state that's it but the same pagan authors like Claudian for example sank to to Theodosius after, after the battle, uh, O nimium dilecta deo cui militat uh, ether, right? Um, this is from the panegyric. Is the um, uh, it, the title is Claudiani Panegyricus de Tertio Consulatu Honori, right? And that it was you know praising, in fact, Honorius' father, uh, saying, oh, "Look, that even." the air like uh, is fighting from your side oh loved by god right and you here we see the overlapping of paganism and christianity also in, in this celestial deity right that sends the elements to favor the the uh, th this is important because if you look at the uh, the the germanic peoples they were thinking the same identical thing Right. If you look at the history of the Longobards, when they cr they fight against the Aeroli, they from from the Longobard side in the myth they, they arrived at the thunder thunderstorm of that was Vodan himself, right? And obviously the Aeroli get slaughtered right, by the Longobards. And it, these are shared beliefs, and there is a, a joint here of, of of culture of of you know of vision of, of the world and of dynamics that could favor the overlapping of of paganism and Christianity uh, in itself. So by replicating this miracle from a pagan into a Christian context, you see um, essentially that for in for example in medieval historiography that 
uh, these are the, the same identical models, right? For big trees, for for many centuries, would have been uh, in in favor of God, right? Uh, there is no. If you read a, an early medieval uh, account of battles, what do you think? You can't reconstruct a battle. What that for? It's written that simply that God decided the battle. Because it was literally God deciding the battle. I mean, those people literally be believed that, and that's why also war was a, uh, you know, think about judicial duel. It was the same thing on a large scale, just to quote von Clausewitz once again. Uh, it, uh, it was the same as uh, a trial by combat in a Christian world, right? So what had been apparently prerogative of the pagan world lived successfully <laughs> in the Christian one in the same identical way, right? Um, and, and this goes along with, of course, the defeats um, seen as proofs of div divine wrath and punishments sent to the people uh, to, you know, as, to as a discount for, you know, uh, their, their sins, right? And, and therefore the Lord became once again the god of battles just like in the old testament do you understand the shift here this is important because if you look at charlemagne for example well he was all about the old testament like he was charlemagne was much more of a jew <laughs> than a christian to tell it all and you know that in the old testament god fights alongside uh, the arm um, uh, the armies of the israelites and the same thing in, in the new testament uh, this is, let's say, metaphorized um, I in a way that where, of course, there is a, a the, there is the beautiful prologue to John's uh, Gospel that really tells you everything in a almost uh, Manichaean perspective. This is uh, this eternal struggle between good and evil, and you you see that that spark has yet not been obscured, and that well, the they, the the forces of evil will not make it at the end. But the idea here is that it, it, it's a brutal, that the, the life of the universe as life of humans is an eternal struggle between good and evil that is fought uh, uh, in as much as in, 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 um, in, uh, at a spiritual level as in at a physical level. These guys were really fighting for real pretty damn so this is also a pretty you know interesting memento to those people who think that that christianity diminished the the, the combativity of roman armies like are you kidding me D do you see what these people were believing in right um so um so the the long profound favor enjoyed by christian culture by from the Old Testament and the Apocalypse uh, before that sort of evangelical rebirth that would occur into the low Middle Ages with the um, popular religious movements um, and you know other phenomena like Franciscanism for example actually maintained this persistent warlike attitude of late antique and early medieval Christian um, Christianity uh, as one of the strongest bases, right? The, the the Christian mindset from 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 the times of Theodosius to the ones of 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 Saint Francis maintained a military character, right? It's a warlike. Uh, experience right vivere militare est that is the uh, uh, as a summa of you know deriving uh, even in here as a concept from the pagan tradition in in a christian lifestyle so we're talking about victories as divine signs like the one of the frigidus river of uh, divine signs of, uh, of misfortune as well like uh, the sack of rome by the Visigoths of Alaric, but um, we can't forget uh, in this historical context that victories and defeats 
um, were still um, costly, very costly, as all wars, right? We the the Christians of that time couldn't, you know, fake behind this beautiful and actually very sophisticated adaptation of of of, of Christian values and and uh, civil commitment that such military activities were based on piles of human beings right uh, created uh, in the image of God himself and that were suppressed by fratricidal hands right so uh, Christianity even at that time quite meaningfully didn't shut its eyes uh, in front of this immense reflection uh, this mirror of the curse of Cain that was and remained the spectacle of war right it's the very mm, you know hearting uh, reality that was naturally embarrassing the most Christian orders uh, not less than the single faithful right that were witnessing the physical suppression of their of their brothers right and this um, uh, point was or had already been addressed if you for example look at Saint uh, Athanasius of Alexandria well he also had made an exception for for the killing in war that according to him could not be considered like an homicide but at the same time you know his insistence on this point also shows the unease and uncertainty that at the bottom that uh, couldn't couldn't be suppressed right because still that was a sin so this is very important to remember killing does remain a sin even if Christianity backs uh, the political and military action of the state of the Christian state um, and the dialectics remains like the church is not like still a part of the state the, the church is always something else right so it's not a matter of um, backing the state for like just now the, the Christian elites were you know allied with the with the emperors um, it was also a matter of saying well someone must take care of certain things like there is a sacrifice in this regard that someone has to do and it's still a very bad thing right uh, here the problem is literally not much you know the, the person is being killed the problem is who survives also to cope with it and to be still be considered with it as a part of, of uh, Christian society most of these people were excommunicated right for a long time this would remain um, especially in the Byzantine world as a more serious issue but even in East uh, excuse me in uh, early medieval I mean in Western Europe during the early medieval ages we, ma we made a bit about this bloodshed and penitence on uh, in that context that it was taken seriously right and this is interesting because it also shows how um, it, it's not true that these peoples were just um, bloody uh, you know heartless cynical individuals who just thought about power so that there was a a concrete problem that is posed uh, by the political action that you can't say um, you know this is simply uh, a matter of you know power and prestige you you do you do bear an enormous responsibility the fake picture of tyrants at the top of society banqueting on you know the miseries of the rest of the world is a quite you know populistic vision of reality is quite inaccurate uh, from a political civil moral and historical point of view it, it's not true right uh, ruling a state is an immensely difficult task and that's why it requires uh, a moral system that is you know able not to commend um, mistakes but to urge constantly to the you know, perfectioning of this action um, so mm, the 
th this thing was was remembered eventually in um, many fields. In, in, for example, in the Eastern Church, um, the entire community was quite um, strenuously. For example, the the Syrian Mesopotamian Church that at this point was in between. Like there were many Christians also in the Persian Empire, but those took another very different direction. Um, and that and that constituted an important legacy. The, the Christian legacy outside the Roman Empire in that period is immense. Christianity was to arrive up to China at that point. Um, also, Saint Basil still, however, within the Roman Empire, fully and become the, the greatest authority. It's bit Augustine in, in the West, as in forms of points of reference as a legacy. Well, Basil of Caesarea uh, didn't hesitate to condemn in block every form of assassination right and and there is no reason to think that this implicitly excluded actually the one perpetrated in war right and in fact if you killed someone in war even as a soldier as an imperial soldier was doing his duty you were excluded from the communion for three years now I don't know about the the actual uh, enforcement of this role but now, it, this actually finds reflection also in, in the West that even if you know it got eventually you know uh, you know uh, resubstantiated you know morally speaking by a bit of of brutal Germanic military ethos, it it kind of actually was pretty you know was fully mm, it was following after all fully the. Um, that the ideal that as as Christian society, you know, it was still a sin to do that and to kill and and that you had to pay for it in theory. And it was a big deal, right? Because this is not just about war in itself, because war is kind of paradoxically one of the la the least controversial aspects in this regard. Especially, you know, if you get invaded by someone, you know, you may say, well, okay, yeah, there were many problems revolving around how you enact war and whatever, but that's quite obvious. You're gonna fight back. But think about public order as well. Like you, all with this Germanic people settled down, and there was all the problem of judicial duel. How how you you deliver justice? Always remember justice. How do you, if you can essentially challenge someone to combat with a, you know, dual champion and win the cause simply because you had the best champion? What kind of justice is that? It really sucks. I mean, yeah, the, the people believe that that's a fair way to do it, but as a civil state you see that that's brutal limit and in fact there were certain Romano-Germanic legislation that even from a in fact a Germanic background were saying you know we should suppress this thing because it sucks right civilly speaking and I, 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 I like really to insist on the on on the moral problem here because you know sometimes we tend to make a bit of moral relativism saying oh but come on these peoples were maybe a bit all the same right they after all, there were just different cultures. This is cultural relativism. There were cultures that, you know, were pretty damn um, brutal, and it, it doesn't matter how how many people were killed, paradoxically, but in, in the name of which, in, in which on base of which motive that was done, because once again, if you shoot down a terrorist, it's kind of fine, um, but. It's not always like that. If you think that war is just a lifestyle, and you live like a tribal warrior f just for the sake of your personal charisma and prestige. That that is essentially what your you, you revolve, uh, you know, the, the world edus revolves around. Because you essentially just only at the head of a clan. I it's one thing. If you have to rule a kingdom, that that's a wholly different matter, and you can't behave like like a barbarian when you rule a kingdom right and I must say that uh, early medieval history shows pretty damn well um, the you know degrees of civilizations that certain policies uh, polities actually acquired right so that let's not confuse uh, let, let's uh, contextualize everything so that you understand why certain peoples did what they did and in that case you maybe you don't judge them but at least you you acknowledge the you know the potential that there is that, uh, and and how close it, it 
gets fulfilled in in, in an evol in a positive evolution, right? But don't think it it's all the same and it's all fine. It's all about tradition and and culture. Yeah, it's fine. No, it's not fine, right? Um, Drawing women in in swamps uh, like the Germanic populations did, if they you know uh, uh, try to to get out of their determined social role, may have been functional to that society, but it's actually not a good thing. And it's a, it's a good thing that Germanic society transformed into something else from that point, right? And I it's a path of civilization. It's th there is nothing to do about it. We we fortunately underwent it, right? Uh, with some success, but we can always better uh, each other uh, in this regard. Um, so, regarding to the problems of violence in itself, it's obvious that uh, when, and, and this is the point I'm making really, is that when a state is in trouble, right, and you see that uh, the, the, the st structures are you know, weakening uh, sensibly, and the, the barbarians are at the gate, and um, you must uh, accept at least the fact that war is necessary by certain standard, right? You you can't act as if, you know, now we just wait and see what happens, because that's living the initiative to people that are going to exploit it quite quickly, right? So the matter actually shifted quite uh, quite quickly, after all, from the jus in bello to the jus ad bellum, that is, respectively, from the, uh, let's say, individual behavior in war, um, including uh, and actually considered in uh, as a very important thing the suppression of the enemy, to the problems of the you know, right, the, you know, more or less righteousness of the single wars, right? Uh, what does this mean actually? Well, that um, the problem gets uh, at a further stage um, that I would call of civilization in this regard because it, uh, you know, it's dangerous to say, but um, yeah, it's important that every individual maintains his own. Um, morality and sensitivity and whatever, but you know we all know that armies are sent out there to do certain specific things, and at that point you're trained to do one and one thing only, and you can't think whether you know it's your right or not to kill someone. You will just do it, and we know it from the entire military history that that's how it happens. That it's extremely easy to send men to kill each other, right? Um, so the problem there was shifted at, at a, another level of civilization, in the at a higher level of civilization, because the problem was not much of reasoning on the individual soldier, right? Uh, it, it was really saying, but how would do we justify this war in the first place, right? Um, so in other words, the from from a matter of personal co uh, conscience, um, war in the Christianized empire b became a community and social spiritual problem, right? Uh, which is interesting because it does not exclude the um, you know the public. Um, sensitivity in some form, like the, the church is a community, right, and it has a spirit on its own in Christian terms, so um, it's a problem of every Christian what the church does, including backing uh, a political authority that wages war and kills, right, and destroys, etc., and slaves, because slaves were still there, right. So Ambrose, coming back to our Milanese bishop, um, clarifying on the base of what we said about Cicero before that, b that basically there are two ways of being unjust. The first one is commit the injustice and the other is leaving that others committed without defending the people who were hit by it. Concluded that there were um, wars that would have been unjust not to do. 
right? This is not just a rhetorical experience, it's literally the thing, right? That, okay, you may have problems to, to, to fight, right, in the first place, but if you see a, a, a person that is weaker than you, that is being bitten, uh, to blood, uh, to the blood by a person that you can't stop with your physical force. Well, you have a duty to use violence in that case, and if you don't do it, you're just a coward scum. And this seems to me a pretty reasonable point, right? This opens to other problems because it's also a matter of who effectively exercises that violence. Because you see, uh, where's the limit between self-defense? and aggression because you know there is an excess of self-defense at the same time so who does establish which is fair or not right you do need an authority you need uh, you need a state right that can fail because Christianity did retain the concept the sacred concept in my opinion that yes you must generally be mindful of, of the law of the state etc but don't take it take um, that authority passively because it's an earthly authority it's rigged by original sin as well it's made by men right just like the church telling the truth right that the church is holy uh, in the Christian perspective uh, because it's been founded by Christ but it uh, you know it's left to people so everybody can fail and in and, and this in in acknowledging this you are basically awakening your individual conscience conscience that is to say okay uh, i don't live in a world where i need i i have you know everything i'm ordered to do even as a soldier even as a citizen and i i have to do it i still have my own um sacred right to to choose autonomously and this is what christianity even in the moment of, of repression of heresies, of you know, burning people at stakes and uh, other things, has always recognized, right? In the Roman Empire, in the pagan Roman Empire, you were not free of, of just saying, I, 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 you, you were called to perform the sacrifice to public authority, otherwise you were put to death, because the, the, they believed that essentially that if you didn't perform that sacrifice, uh, the gods would punish the entire society. So that was hideous, but at least everybody could believe whatever they wanted. With Christianity, it's the inversion of this, right? You were recognized to, to you know, to resist the authority by individual, um, you know, uh, force, but at the same time, all the other cults were wiped out. Progressively, I mean, gradually, and, uh, but still violently, and so it's hideous in another way. Right, but it's it's a sort of, of, of the price that gets paid uh, at some point also to maintain a certain cohesion, right? Don't think that these are just um, monstrous, tyrannical um, policies. That there is a, a concrete need to do this that goes beyond the mere ambition of a, of a leader or uh, the immorality of, of a certain group, or faction, whatever. Um, so, um, Ambrose in here is naturally refined, is bringing forward something that uh, up to that point had not been justified on these moral grounds. So, as a consequence of this uh, constant evaluation of whether war is just or not, basically the, the Christian was nailed to the duty to fight uh, the and in the uh, wars that were defined as just but on the other hand the church um, basically decided right at least had its own saying in defining which one of these wars was you know to be consider as just or not, were just or not in the first place. So it's obvious that Ambrose is, is playing here on the circumstances, which is which is fair, right? We will all have like to have a, an easy answer, like what do I do now? Where it, it has to be determined. And the fact that 
there is a church here that determines that, that means especially at the time, actually a pretty still non-stratified and pretty still democratic society because effectively bishops came to councils from everywhere, right? So there wasn't a true center like eventually with uh, with the papal monarchy, etc. So it was still uh, also a matter of, of you know having a a, dis uh, a discussion with with people who can think differently here then. But the decision of the councils is somewhat definitive and it represents that decisiveness that is required in the political action. There is not an indeterminate, uh, let's think now what do we need to do, hmm, maybe I think twice and then the worst things happen as a consequence because that is immoral as well. Hence the need of an authority. You can't live in a society without a hierarchy because that is dysfunctional and it causes more problems than the damage than a mistake of the hierarchy can do. Anarchy does not work. Sorry <laughs> to disappoint, I know there should be some anarchist among you at this point, but um, but it's not what uh, what social sciences, uh, what even psychology actually shows. It, it's not how the, that works. Um, and yeah, and, and then naturally Augustine, it would, it would be interesting to talk about Augustine, but obviously we don't have the time to do it. But it's obvious that the aim of figures of this great man as Augustine, as Ambrose, is um, that uh, this decision is aimed at an extremely moral objective, that is to preserve and in or to reestablish the highest good of peace according to justice right the ultimate goal of all this is to live in peace we make war to live in peace it sounds like an oxymoron but it's actually not it is true you can't live in a world in a pacified world if you don't have a deterrent force there that is as long as there is a criminal that tries to do something else you, know, you have an axe falling on his head right that is a civilized world in other words violence helps to civilize the world it helps there is no discipline without violence and without discipline there there can't be a, an order without order there can't be peace and there can't be justice and it is true right there is no doubt about this of any sort uh, you can context step by step whether uh, you know every decision is right or not but then naturally that's the pattern you must follow because without that it's worse and the interesting thing about uh, this vision in Ambrose also in Augustine as a matter of fact uh, as a conclusive line is that there is naturally a war properly meant um, against the foreign enemies like the barbarians like um, the heretics, maybe not as foreigners, but I mean, you understand, even as groups that were collectively either pagan or, or, or Aryans, as we have seen with the gods before. But there is another aspect that is more civil, like is what the police would take care of, not the army, not, uh, not the military. That is um, pacifying society against common criminals saving society from murders, from thieves, for, from rapists, from scum, right? And, and, and that is fair as well, and therefore we need violence even in that regard. At that time, those people were called the latrones, right? Um, which is a very interesting term. Why? Because Jesus Christ had been crucified exactly like a latra, right? The latrones were those criminals that were essentially infamous ones, right? The, in the Roman um, legal system, like e, there were certain crimes that basically degraded your your person, right? Um, if it was a political choice that had brought to you, you know, if you had infringed law like a man in some way. Um, you had the right to be decapitated, that for a Roman was the sole um, right to death, the, 
you know, decent death, right? Death by decapitation for a Roman was a, a privilege. Hmm? That's why, for example, um, St. Paul was decapitated while St. Peter was crucified because St. Paul was a Roman citizen, right? And St. Peter was also crucified upside down to make it more infamous. Well, crucifixion, he said, in fact, was a, a death penalty inflicted to the scum of society. And that's one of the reasons why the Romans crucified Jesus, uh, because Jesus had been accused of being uh, the, the fake Messiah, right? Um, and this death was more infamous in many ways, so that, you know, Jesus, King uh, of the Jews, that was written on, and, and, and when the, mm, and when you think about this in perspective, you see that um, the church here is recognizing fully Christ's sacrifice uh, and the misunderstanding of humanity um, at that point, exactly because they were realizing that in society there are people who are, um, you know, Jesus got crucified with the other two people, one gets saved and the other not, so salvation, no man is beyond uh, salvation, right? Uh, but at the same time, the same Christians recognize that the order there is needed, that there is uh, a sin that cannot be simply eliminated. So. The Christians, uh, you know, venerate the symbol of the cross as the, the symbol of penalty for, for common criminals, right? Actu actually, lower criminals, the infamous criminals, because it's the symbol of human sin in itself, right? The, the idea of, the of a consequence of the, of the mi human misunderstanding, right, that eventually becomes the symbol of Christianity as instead the symbol of the death and of the resurrection and um, the point here is that a, a Christian society that becomes a state that becomes a, a civilization on its own that has to regulate society still recognizes that order is necessary there must be a justice that it doesn't matter how in unjust it can be because it's imperfect because it's humanly built, right? But it has to be. And it has to be enforced by someone who is chosen by God in this regard and to be possibly backed up by the church because there is no no necessity, like no 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 advantage in you know creating uh, um you know further friction I I in a state that is already in difficulty. Right, and that requires a unity of aims, of intents, right? And that uh, St. Ambrose declined um, with this important realization that also war must be uh, uh, fought uh, in, in some occasions because it would be wrong not to do so in the name of justice. And another time we'll talk about Augustine as, in fact, the theologian of war proper, um, but that's another chapter, let's say. Um, so, yeah, I think this is all for today. It's a pretty long video, but I think it's worth it. And I just hope that you uh, enjoyed this video. I wish you a uh, happy Easter, even though it's almost already passed. Um, and uh, I hope you're doing fine. Uh, I send you all my my best wishes really because of this sad yet hopeful time as I told you also in, in the comments in the community and um, this is the idea that there is the hope for a better society that requires however commitment to be achieved like we can't hope and not do anything we must act for good because we are all responsible for what we do and there is no excuse behind that right and sometimes we also have to do something that is not, um, that is against our our feelings, our 
apparently beyond our capabilities because we, we fear that and we don't feel ready and we think it's wrong and we're challenged by it but sometimes it is the right thing to do and we can feel we can understand what it when it is the case right anyhow for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video and again uh, if you did please share it uh, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye